I'm Karen. I'm Barry, and we own Circus of Books. I thought it was just a bookstore with a circus theme. <laughs> circus of Books was the center of the gay universe. Just like porn, P-O-R-N. If anyone asked us what our parents did... These are called cock rings. The official answer was... We own a bookstore. Porn has always had a place in the gay community. To see men naked and unafraid. They're not offended, they're not scandalized. It's their job. This guy here, Hand Jobs Magazine, now he does organic chicken farming. So when I order from him, we catch up on his chickens. There it goes. Hi. Rachel. Hello. How are you? Jeff in Vegas. How are you this afternoon? I'm great. Rachel from Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is going to get really crazy because I have, my life is so similar to what your parents and your life was. That's why I saw this and I had to reach out to you. Wow. Uh, and we'll get to that. But first, um, so your parents own the most famous and bookstore in LA, adult bookstore. And, uh, and the family was totally keeping it from the children. That's just incredible. Yep. Completely, 100%. It was a family secret. Well, it was more than a family secret. It was a, it was a total secret. They just kept it from everybody, yeah. And Larry Flint, uh, I, I visit the Four Seasons all the time when I do junkets for films, and I've run into Larry Flint. He has lunch there every day at the Four Seasons, and he was instrumental in setting your family up with the bookstore or the inventory. Exactly. And my parents were also instrumental in setting him up with local distributors in LA, which I didn't know until I interviewed him. He said they were really one of my very first distributors. And he was really um, very grateful. And I was shocked because, you know, he owns an empire. And he said, no, they really, really, really were the first ones in LA. And, you know, I think he feels loyalty to the people that were there with him from the beginning. And then your family expanded to videos uh, and then yeah. starting producing videos. I mean, <laughs> this, this documentary kept getting more crazy. Yep. Well, you know, I, I think as any, that's my parents are very good small business owners. And, you know, in a way, the American dream is built on that. It's like when an opportunity comes to you, if you're going to not be judgmental, even though Ironically, as you'll find out, my mom clearly was, you know, um, if you're going to have an open mind, you know, and, and be a capitalist, you're going to just make a living the way you, you can. And, and she really did say at one point, you know, she never thought she was going into pornography, just another aspect of the same business. And I think that's how she operated the whole time. And your, the store became a safe haven for the gay community because in the 1980s, it was still dangerous to be gay. It was a horrible time for the gay community. And, you know, I think that's what a lot of people forget, even within the gay community now. And I'm a part of that community and I'm shocked. People don't even know about the AIDS epidemic. I mean, really, young people don't know about it. And so- and you, you touched on that in the documentary and everybody that in that industry, your family touched all their lives. It was really heartbreaking. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there were so few people looking at the, the gay community was very easy to vilify. They were easy to make fun of. They were like the butt of all jokes in the media. And, you know, you saw even the way that they were talked about. Um, it was it was really disgusting. It would be like it would be like if we were using racist terms to talk about, you know, um, not white people in the media. I mean, it was a really sick way that people would just talk about gay people. And so when there was a crisis like what we we have right now with coronavirus focused on this one group of people the government and, and was not there to help them nobody was there and so my parents happened to be at the center of this crisis and you know I think their real act of grace was that they just did what was sort of the right thing to do and they didn't look down on these people when the rest of society you know, and even though your parents kept what they did a secret, their empire kept growing so quickly, they mailed three videotapes to a, a certain address and then it was a sting. The FBI uh, yep. charged your parents with shipping obscene material. That's the only thing they could get. But the First right. Amendment came to their rescue. Well, yeah, and it goes to show you what our government does with our tax dollars behind our, you know, we don't know what our tax dollars are going to. And I think that's actually one of the biggest things to look at is that you know, even right now, where are our tax dollars? You know, why are they bailing out some companies and not others? And, and why, and do you want a sting operation taking down some small, small time businesses 
for some D VHS tapes. I mean, that's actually a huge waste of the money that we all pay to this giant institution. So I found that to be so gross that I wanted to reveal it in this story. There's such parallels in your story and- uh, well, Yeah, I'd love to hear about yours, you well, were saying. Just, first of all, in Las Vegas, and you know, I'm Generation X, I, you know, so I graduated high school in 1984, and Las Vegas was notorious for certain adult bookstores. We even had a gay area called the Fruit Loop, which had uh, the adult bookstores, the adult bars, the Gypsy, which was really famous that was there, um, but also just people went into there and to get videotapes. But then after I graduated from high school in 1995, I opened my first video store. Yeah, you know, at, at 19 years old, and by and I sold them all in 1991 because uh, Blockbuster was coming down. I saw the, the handwriting on the wall, and I went back to school where I went got my film degree and my journalism degree. But the thing is, we order tapes from your company. When I saw those titles, uh, because those adult titles, we had to keep the swinging doors on the front too. That was the law. So I was it was bringing back all these memories of running these video stores, and the adult films made so you much ordered fun. From video were, huh? Wait, wait, you. You ordered from Video 10? You ordered from Video oh, 10? We, we had Jeff Stryker videos. We had, oh, yeah, we're talking in the 80s. We, we ordered those titles, and I remember them, and a lot of women rented them, believe it or not. Jeff Stryker was so popular, it was ridiculous. Wow, you know what is so interesting that you say that? Yeah, that, that's actually interesting. I, I am so, I'm surprised to learn that a lot of women rented them. Okay, so you were running, when you worked in a store or you ran the video store? I owned the video store. And then I had one across from the Hard Rock Hotel. I had one uh, downtown. I had uh, one oh, on the street. I'll so ask I my mom if she knew of your store because, um, okay. you know, my the thing about my parents is like w when they, they, they sort of, my mom, she knew everything that was happening in that business. I'm sure she would have remembered your store, Video Island. I'll mention it to her because I know it was Video 10 that you ordered from, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. We ordered from Video 10, we ordered from VSDA, we've ordered from, you know, all the adult companies. But I remember that specifically. I remember that that name because I did all the ordering. My mom had this interesting thing. When, when people would die at their estates, they would often call up the Circus of Books and say, oh, we found a box, you know? <laughs> and my mom would go to the estate because at the end, the store was becoming almost like a vintage porn store. It was really cool. And all these like, you know, drummer magazine and all these cool old vintage magazines you would have loved. So she would go to the estates and she said she would find like a box with magazines in pristine condition that clearly somebody, you know, kept in a very safe place and that they were beloved. And you could feel that like, wow, you know, these were like artifacts of a culture. And I really feel like that was one of my biggest things that I wanted to do with this film was just kind of preserve this cultural artifact because I totally agree with you. Like kids are, totally not getting it and they get everything so quickly on the internet and and it really was a a hard like challenge to make that material in the first place and even to consume it you know it took guts to walk into a store and buy a magazine yeah there's no more hiding magazines anymore <laughs> just that, yeah. all that all that coming of age stuff that everyone has a story about whether being in a playboy or anything else that doesn't exist anymore i mean that that innocence is not there anymore because uh, it's just, it's a bygone era. Also, the digital age, I mean, that really put the end of an era to your family's bookstore, I'm sure. Yeah. No, it really did. And I think, you know, I think that's kind of the, it's bittersweet because of course that's how we find each other now, you know, like it's amazing. You can find, you know, I, I, I have to say like, I'm always aware of what's happening right now in the trans community because of my lover and, and, you know, these people didn't have anybody to find. And it was very, very hard. So on one hand, it's amazing and great that we have communities now for small groups of people. But on the other hand, you know, the stores and the magazines that had to exist, they were this incredible culture. You know, at one point, Alaska in the movie talks about flagging and, you know, bandanas and the kind of like secret nods and handshakes. I and mean, it was a real subculture. And I think that's what you know, we miss the beauty and the richness that's in that because now we don't need it anymore. You don't need to speak in coded language and have bandanas, but back then you did. And, and that's actually really amazing and cool. You know, it's like a tribal culture that is going away. So I, I feel all kind of um, like I'm a steward of, you know, like a curator of, you know, the old erotic content that is just disappearing and I love that material so much and I have a fondness and in fact all the people in the AIDS section in my film 
who you see in the photographs that are fading away, I made a point to find actual images of adult porn actors who just had these looks on their faces, if you watch that section again, because those are not just random gay men who died of AIDS. Those are each individual actors from different movies. And I just wanted them to be humanized because the people in those movies were really brave. You know, it was an incredibly powerful thing to pose and be in a magazine. I mean, Jeff Stryker is a whole other story, but you know, I think pretty much everyone else and you know, he was gay for pay. So. <laughs> right, and he looked like Robert Forrester. Now he looks like the actor Robert Forrester. I was like, wow, there's Jeff Stryker. I mean, yeah, he's, he was, I can't believe how popular he was. He was a superstar. He really was. I'm glad he's doing well. He looks good. He looks healthy. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole nother story there. But yeah, I think all the different, because, you know, he survived and all these other men didn't. And I just wanted to pay homage to them. I was just going to ask you how you took this to Tribeca and, uh, you know, the, the film festival circuit, what's been the yeah. reception? And... Oh my God. Well, you know, I have to say what's happening right now with the coronavirus is making me feel so grateful that I got to have, I mean, I really, I got to have uh, an audience gay audiences see this film. Oh my God, you know, I, Tribeca was a, more of a straight audience. And so that was where we premiered. And then I, I was nervous, freaking out, but it, it got a great reception. But then when we did Outfest and Frameline and all the gay, I mean, everyone got all the references and was laughing. And when Jeff Stryker came on the stream, they're like, ah! you know, and it was, it was so cool to be in a community and to have the reaction and have people laughing. And you know, and, and I remember the conversation when, when my brother Josh would say, Rachel, your world was too gay. And, and everybody would laugh because everyone would get what that meant, you know. And so I, I had a cathartic experience seeing this film with the people that get it, you know, the culture. And so I just feel lucky as hell. I mean, really, the, the gay angels have looked out for this movie. I really believe that because... Fuck. I mean, I, I didn't, how would a movie like this ever get on Netflix? You know? <laughs> Rachel Mason, director of Circus of Books, now on Netflix. Thank you so much for talking to me today. This has been a total thrill. You too. And thank you for reaching out. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. You too. And if you come to Vegas, we'll have coffee or something. We'll okay. You. We'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Rach. Has ever given us anything we haven't had to fight for. I think what we did was small human kindnesses in a very small way. You guys made all of us? Yeah, I was sent you to college. <laughs> <laughs>